Welcome to CXR Unplugged. My name is Phil Dobby and with me today is Mark Scott, who's the Managing Director of Australia's Public Broadcaster, the ABC. Uh, so you've worked obviously in, in commercial roles for, for most of your life before yeah. taking on this gig. A big difference? Uh, to a degree. Of, of course, one of the great things about the ABC is its reach. It reaches into every part of the country and its breadth, you know, television, radio, online, significant international services. Mm. I think, uh, you know, a lot of my professional career was at Fairfax, and I think there's a great passion for the craft that you get in media organisations like mm. this. You know, people don't like to think they're part of a big organisation or a big business. They're passionate in their storytelling, in their ability to break news, and their ability to create compelling content. And so, you know, the craft, the love of the craft, I think, dominates no. the places I've worked. Um, but, but this is a you know, very significant public institution, a much loved public institution, and we face great challenges in this digital era. Now, I mean, you talk about the love of the craft. I mean, I guess you are a journalist, aren't you, yeah. by, by trade? Your, your predecessor was more of a finance man, and the man yeah. before that was a, a salesman. Yeah. So are you the right guy for the job? Is having a journalist at the top important? Uh, well, I, I, others, others will be the judge of that. I, I think it's a good time for the ABC. It's a good time for me to be here. And I think I'm comfortable around content. And I'm comfortable in talking with journalists about their stories and our, our television teams, our radio teams. So I'm very comfortable around what we produce and how we produce it. And I suppose I try and be seriously engaged in the ideas that, that we need to um, embrace in moving to this digital era. I mean, in a sense, power is moving from broadcasters and publishers. Mm. It, it was once an era that, that very few people were broadcasting, very few people could publish, and in a sense, the public just had to, to take what's mm. there. Now, the public has so many choices mm. and the ability to create and share their own content. The challenge for us is, well, what space is there for a public broadcaster in an era of plenty? You know, we were created yeah. in an era of scarcity. Yeah. Now it's an era of plenty. And what role will we play? And I spend a lot of my time now reading and thinking and talking with people around the role that we can play in well, this you, digital era. You do almost have to be all things to all people, don't you? And, and I guess in, in the olden days, when there wasn't a lot of choice, that was easy. But yeah. I guess what you're saying now is that it's harder. Yeah. We talk about a bifurcating audience. Mm. You know, there are still a lot of people who want to sit down on the couch on a Friday night, pick up the remote control and watch what's on ABC television or just get in the car and listen to the radio. And very important that we meet the needs of those audiences. You know, they're taxpayers. Uh, we've been providing those services for a long period of time. We've got to continue to do so. But there are new audiences that really want to take advantage of the opportunity that exists out there in Web 2.0, who want to interact with the content, who want to respond to what we're doing, who want to create their own content. And so part of our challenge is to not just bring people to us on radio and television, to, but to be out there where people are going to be. So yes, a, a Facebook presence, yes, a YouTube presence, yes, be out there on MySpace, yes, be on Twitter. Be engaged at where the audience is going to be, and that's a that's a big cultural change for a grand old institution like mm, this one. Absolutely, yeah, and and I guess there's also the question of do you need to do you need to be everywhere, or do you really fill in the gaps where uh, commercial entities haven't filled? It's a very important question. I think the ABC was established as a comprehensive broadcaster, and we used to provide a full suite of offerings, and and still we do. We're not just there for market failure. But I think what we can see in this era is despite all the choice, areas of market failure are growing, not mm. diminishing, as commercial broadcasters find it harder and harder to get a, a viable and a sustainable return on some of their investments. So there are areas we've walked away from. For example, television sport, when, when I grew up, you know, cricket, uh, Australian mm. rules, rugby league, rugby union, Commonwealth Games, Olympic Games, all broadcast on the ABC. Now I think we can make an argument there's a very viable commercial market for there. We could bid for some of those products, but it would the opportunity cost of that, the other things we wouldn't be able to do would be very significant. So on television, you know, we do the lawn bowls, you know, we do the Paralympics, we do a number of um, high participation women's sport that don't get uh, coverage on commercial media. We do local sport. That's a really good place for us to play, but we let the, the big uh, dollar commercial uh, properties pass by. So that we can demonstrate there are areas that we've, we've seeded the ground, but I would argue we run the best radio coverage of sport in the country and arguably the best online coverage as well. Mm. So we're there as a comprehensive broadcaster, we're just not in every medium uh, with the same level of intensity. So we are forced to make choices, but still we're a comprehensive broadcaster. And in some of our key areas like news, I think the argument is growing that we have a unique role to play 
and that only we are in a position to deliver services that the public wants because we have local, national and international reporters out there. We have radio newsrooms and television newsrooms, a strong online presence. And so as commercial radio and commercial television finds it harder to sustain the investment that's required for news, so the ABC needs to step up. Now you talked about uh, market failure. I mean, could it be the case that if the ABC didn't have those resources and was putting so much into, into creating credible current affairs, that another commercial player would, would step up to the mark? I still think it's hard to demonstrate you know, great profit uh, around news. And I think it's interesting that if you, if you say you take the United States, for example, I think commercial television in the United States, uh, where there isn't a strong public broadcaster on television, is not of a quality that approaches what mm. the ABC has to offer. And by far the best radio on offer in the United States, as far as news and public affairs is concerned, happens on national public radio. So I think if you look at that as an example, there's not a strong example in the United States of, of television news stepping up to the mark to deliver the absence or what the absence of a public broadcaster. Um, you take advantage of that opportunity, if mm. you like. So no, I, I don't think so. Look, we've, always, we've existed with a mixed model here for more than 70 years. Commercial broadcasters and public broadcasters operating uh, side by side. And that's what uh, we feel that we need to continue to do. Now, if you're running a, a commercial operation, and obviously you have been involved in, in, yeah. in a commercial environment before you, you started here, you'd look at a particular uh, type of customer, yeah. you'd segment the market yeah. and say that's the market we're going to go after yeah. and we're going to make that as, as yeah. highly profitable as we can. Yeah. In your current situation, yeah. you have to try and please all people. Yeah. If, you, if you focus too much on a particular uh, target market, uh, then people will be saying, well, hang on a second, we're all paying for the ABC. Yeah. Yes and no. I, I think the BBC more faces that challenge than we do because they have a licence fee and that licence fee uh, means that every household is paying £140 a year. And so I think if you're running the BBC, you're making a series of programming decisions that says you've got to look at every household and ask, do you represent value for that household? We're not in that position here. We are more like a public good. Uh, we're like a park that is provided or a public hospital system or a public education system. Now, you may not have children, but you're still paying for the schools. You might be healthy and you're still paying for the hospitals. That park might be across the road, you may never step foot in it, but you're still paying for it. And in a, in a way, as a society, we're grateful that these services are provided for the benefit of society as a whole, even though we may not personally use it. Mm. So we could drive bigger audiences for ABC television by buying those sporting rights, but we uh, don't do that. And so we know that 90% of the Australian public believe we provide a valuable service, but 90% of the public don't tune in every week. So, no, no, our test is more, is the ABC in the best position to deliver this service? Um, uh, given our history, given our resources, given our experience, given the public expectation, uh, are we the ones that, the, that are in the best position to deliver a service, or can we deliver a compelling and distinctive service? that others won't. They're the kind of tests that we apply rather than saying every household has to be watching you know, one night a week. A lot of old media companies are struggling with the online world, yeah. uh, commercial entities as, as well as the ABC. Uh, you've got a, perhaps a, a problem in that you've got a lot of people who've worked for the ABC for a long time. Um, you mentioned moving anti online. I mean, my mum doesn't understand online. She yeah. doesn't understand. I can't explain to my mum what I do for a living. Yeah. Uh, I can imagine that's a problem with, with, with some, of the, uh, some of the people working in the ABC, uh, let alone uh, trying to figure out from a management point of view exactly what you do online. Um, look, yes and no. I, I think we've experimented with a lot here and we've learned a bit through that experimentation. We can experiment because we don't need to develop um, a business case that says, how will you make a profit on this? You know, when I was at Fairfax, you know, mm. towards the end of my time at Fairfax, you know, business cases needed to be making a profitable return within 12 months. It's very hard to develop an innovative culture when you're under that sort of financial pressure. Here, we need to say, is this a good way of connecting with new audiences in new ways? And if it is, and we can then find the money to seed into it, then we can do it. So we can be, in fact, more innovative on different fronts, I think. And if you look at things like ABC iView, our internet television service, we could do that because we didn't have to make a profit from it. Mm. And we just thought it was a great way of connecting with audiences, and so it's proven to be. The other thing is I think you can really easily underestimate your people when it comes to innovation. And a great example for us is Radio National. I think you would have said a decade ago, 
who's least likely to embrace the digital revolution at the ABC? And mm. some would have said uh, Radio National. Specialist programming, um, uh, uh, you know, possibly an audience that's somewhat set in its ways. Well, the ABC has led the world in podcasting through the initiatives of Radio National. Um, tens of millions of podcasts downloaded of Radio National programming. Um, Apple Computer said to me they thought that the ABC was creating more uh, new podcasting content than almost any other organisation in the world out of a, a trial, an experiment that was driven by a few people at Radio National. And so you can underestimate your, your people. And are, is that bringing new audiences? Are, there, are they new yeah, listeners to Radio National? It is, it is very interesting trend in that you're getting more people listening through the podcasting, you're getting more people around the world listening, and your core radio audience isn't shrinking at all. This is one of the things that we've discovered about fragmenting audiences, that the, the, the potential size of your audience, the audience that actually wants to consume your content, is much bigger than the audience that is available at any one moment, at any one time, to sit down and listen and watch. And if, in fact, you create opportunities for your audience to experience that content, they will in far bigger numbers. Uh, an example we use here, it's a, you know, a year or two old now, is when, when the chaser uh, did the APEC skit and they put that motorcade through the security barrier. Uh, Three million people watched that on a, on a Wednesday night. Hundreds of thousands more when we replayed it on a Friday night. Even more when we replayed it on the weekend on ABC2. Uh, it became one of the biggest selling DVDs in the country and mm. a million people downloaded it as well. A million mm. uh, additional downloads because it was great content, people wanted to see it, and you've actually got to put that content out where people can find it. And, and you know, one of the things that we are wrestling with is, say, our engagement around things like Facebook. Uh, if you're in commercial media, you fundamentally have to bring those online audiences back to your home site for you to monetize them, for you to get the click through, for you to drive your traffic so you can get advertising. Mm. We're not in that position. Um, we just want people to experience content that's created by the ABC that they know the ABC has created and we want to get it out to them. And so one of our new distribution uh, mechanisms will be Facebook. Now I saw figures last night that said 8 million Australians a month are now on Facebook. And what they represent to us is a distribution channel. Mm. We are developing widgets that allow as part of our content to be taken for you to put that on your Facebook page so that you are a distributor of our content to your friends and associates who, are, who visit your Facebook page. And for, we, for the next two years, till no one's using Facebook, yeah, but I guess it applies to whatever follows. I think that's mm. absolutely right. And mm. what you can't do in this space is to sit on your hands and wait. Well, when the revolution is over, we'll decide <laughs> where we want to play. You've got to get with mm. it. One of the things I, when I started here with a five year contract, I spent a lot of my time trying to think, well, what's the world going to be like in 2011? Where's it going to be? What do we need to do? And I realized that's a very difficult that's impossible mm. in this industry more than any other. And some of the things that are very live and vibrant that we're dealing with now, like Facebook and Twitter, they were hardly on the radar in 2006. What you actually do, though, is you realise that the direction is that way. You know, that's the way you're going. They're the trends. You've got to be moving with some momentum in that direction. And then you can calibrate and fine-tune precisely where you need to go and what you've got to do under the changing circumstances. So it might well be that the crowd moves on from Facebook, but they're not going to move on from social networking. Mm. They're not going to move on with connecting online in that way. And we will learn so much through the Facebook experience that if something replaces Facebook, we will be equipped and ready to deal with that at the time. So this is a world, isn't it, that's moving very, very quickly. Yeah. Uh, and I think a, a lot of the, the, the commercial media are going to struggle to survive and perhaps have the, uh, the ability to move fairly swiftly. Are you yeah. going to be able to, to keep up the pace, do you think? Yeah, I, I think so. I, yeah. I think, um, you know, we're funded by the taxpayers. We're funded by government. I think we've made strong case on, on the unique role the ABC needs to play uh, in news, as I've mentioned, in, do, in telling the Australian story, Australian drama, in delivering services in regional and rural Australia. There are a number of areas that I think people are saying now, if the ABC wasn't there, no one would be able to provide these right. uh, services. So I think we've made that case. I think we've got to manage our growth uh, and be invest wisely and, and surely. We've got to continue to be innovative. 
and we've got to experiment and, and find new ways of engaging with audiences at the same time as we've got to be delivering the bill on Saturday night and classic FM mm. and a lot of the traditional services that we've delivered. And that's part of the rich complexity of the job. So the bill's going to be on Saturday night for some time to come. My, uh, my predecessor's <laughs> one piece of advice was don't muck around with the bill. You know, it's the one way of guaranteeing 5,000 letters. One final question. A, an MD at the end of five years mm. would look and say, what a great job I've done. I've increased margins or I've increased EBIT yeah. or you know, profit is looking good, share price has gone up. What will be your legacy? How are you going to measure yourself so that in five years' time you can say, I've done a good job? Yeah, I, I, I don't spend too much time on the legacy, uh, on the legacy front. I think, though, we talk about connecting with more Australians in more ways more often. And I think what I'm in pursuit of here, you know, with the support of the board, with the support of the management team, is a more nimble, flexible and innovative ABC that is still able to create compelling, distinctive, high quality content and then uses all the opportunities available in this digital era to connect that content with audiences in new ways. So that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. So it's no longer just an old style radio or television uh, organisation, but it's a dynamic, flexible, integrated, compelling um, digital media organisation. That's the path I think we're, we're going down. Mm. You know, one of the things that people have said to me is that the ABC seems pretty quiet uh, these days. You know, we don't, we don't hemorrhage in the headlines, there's not great controversy, there aren't journalists camped out outside board meetings, the temperature's lower. That's great and that's been part of a plan. But I wouldn't want anyone to underestimate the extent of the revolution uh, underway here. I'm just not one of those people who thinks you need to conduct a revolution with a, with a guillotine and blood on your sword. You can get a lot done by having some clarity around the direction you're going and bringing people with you. And I think the ABC staff have been heroic through this. We have so much change underway. They're embracing that with confidence. They believe the ABC story. They believe our strongest days are ahead of us. And we're all at work together on it. But we're doing it with some focus and some intensity and some quietness. And I think that's a positive thing. Mark Scott, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Phil.